Good afternoon. Let me uh, put all your phones away and everything that uh, could be distracting to you. Um, I want you guys to right now, before we get started on everything, to do uh, to take out your syllabus for me. So everybody, take out your syllabus. Um, I got a couple emails over the weekend from very diligent students. Can I borrow yours? And um, they're good emails and questions about one thing that I think I will include on my next iteration of the class. Um, and this regard to what, is, what are you guys supposed to do when there is no chapter in the book that corresponds with the subject matter? And I may have gone over this at the beginning of class, but these weeks there will be no assigned reading, nor will there be questions from the text on, uh, on the quizzes. All right. Okay, so I want to go over the weeks that are that have this with it. The first one is today, this week, the sociology of food and social network analysis. There is no text readings for these. Okay, so you have the week off from the text. Um, you know, if you're trying to plow through the text, trying to figure out what was on the reading for today, um, you didn't find anything because there is nothing on there. All right. The next, uh, the next week that there is no assigned reading for from the text is um, sociology of emotions. You, I would write that right next to it so you're not looking for any text pages to read for these weeks. So the sociology of emotions does not have any corresponding text. All of the questions on the quizzes will be from my lecture. Okay, All the quizzes, questions from the quiz, quizzes will, and the final will be from my lecture. There's no text for that. And then I believe the next one is the sociology of sport, which is a great, interesting topic. There is no sociology of sport chapter in our textbook. Okay, so that will, that's another one that has no corresponding textbook pages to it. And then the, the last one uh, would be the socio, uh, media, sociology of media. There is no sociology of media text uh, chapter in our text. So that's going to be all based on my lectures as well. All right, so you have four chapters that you don't have, to, or four units that you don't have to read chapters in the book from, okay? Does that make sense, everybody? Okay, so here's, here's the thing. If you miss a class, it's, it, you can't just read the chapter. I mean, obviously you see that there's some overlap, some overlap between my lecture and the text, and then some stuff that's not in my lecture that's on the text and some stuff that's exclusive. Are there questions? You guys have questions? Okay. So, no questions? No? Okay, because I'm here to help if, you, if, if there's something you need to know. So, what we're going to talk about today is a very good topic to learn for your term paper. Massive, massively good topic to learn for your term paper. Because what I'm going to do for you guys is I'm going to model a subject, a topic that you guys could use for, you know, how to come up with a good term paper topic for yourself, okay? Um, and before we get going on that, just so I, I, I know, who, ha who in here has received uh, the email this last weekend on the essay resources on Blackboard? Okay, so that means everybody. That's great. So what that is, let me just kind of talk about that real quick. On Blackboard, you guys, I put a lot of resources. All the handouts I gave you on the essays, uh, the structure, the example essay, all that kind of stuff, I put it on Blackboard. Then I also made a discussion forum that you can go on there and, and just kind of like talk amongst yourselves. And also, I will go on that forum to check to see how your topics are coming along. Um, and then also, it's the turn it in link. So you have all that stuff, all kinds of resources on that Blackboard to help you with your essay. So the first question I'll ask you if you're asking me for help on your essays will be, have you gone to Blackboard? Because that is, that's your first stop. And, and then if you, if you have and you still have other questions, then I'll help you from there on out. Um, but I'd like to see you guys you know, go on that and use that. Actually, you should do that. I mean, it'd be better for you for your essays, OK? Um, so all your essay resources on there, all the stuff you'll possibly need for your essays are on that. Go on there and check that out. Uh, plus, you'll have to get familiar with how to use Turnitin on there, too. So I would go check that out as well. All right, any questions on that? Okay, so I've had about eh, 20, 30 people check their topics with me, and some good ones. We've had some really good ones, actually. So I would rather 
you guys check your topic with me so that I can help you get, you know, focus in on your good topics so that we have good essays, you know, at the end. Because that makes it way more fun for you. Um, some really interesting stuff. So to that end, let's, let's get started on what we're talking about today. And I remember telling you guys, you may have remembered this from the beginning of class, one of the things that you could do with our subject matter, you could basically fill in the blank here, the sociology of. <laughs> everything in our, our social fabric, our culture, our nationalistic views, everything that we have in our lives has and can be analyzed sociologically. This is what takes it out of the realm of psychology. This is what takes it out of the realm of anthropology in a lot of ways. You can really get a, you know, the sociology of, of almost anything, okay? We talked about that. Well, today, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you guys how to analyze a subject matter so that you can learn, okay, and all, uh, about how to do this with your topic for your paper. And also, it's an interesting subject matter. It's one that I have somewhat um, a, a fair amount of experience with, and that's the sociology of food. So that's what we're filling in the blanks here today with. This is sociology of food. That's what we're going to talk about today. Now, this might seem like a random topic. Like, why would you stick the sociology of food in with sociology 101? Well, just for this reason. I want you guys to see how I'm going to break this down so that you can write a term paper that would look very similar to this and, and be structured in a way that makes sense. Okay, so we're going to break down this topic of the sociology of food so that you can model how to write an essay. Plus, it also shows you guys how to use sociological terms. Um, all my classes so far that I've done this with in the past and this, and this week have been wonderful in terms of what they have contributed with in our discussion. And so I want you to keep your brain clicking um, and so that if you can offer up something when, when we get to a chance where we're going to pause, I'm going to ask you guys a question on this. So when you break down the sociology of food, one of the things you have to do with a topic, for this is just for your essay, is you have to read around your issue. Okay? Read around the issue. And so what that means is just that. You're going to have to go online, go to the library, go somewhere and then you would put in the sociology of food. You would, do, you would do what we call information gathering, which is different than research. So you would go in and you would say the sociology of food. Now, some of you people in here right now, if you had to do like a search on Google or something like that, what words would you, you would first put in the sociology of food, okay? Because you might come up with some good results with that one. What would be some other words you put in there? Just, out of top, just off the top of your head. What other words would you, could you use? Yeah. Food and addiction. Wonderful. Sociology of food and addiction. Great. That's going to get you a whole new slew of articles. And in and of itself could be a good topic for, socio for your term paper. Food addiction would be, you know, food addictions would be a good topic for your term paper. Yeah. Culture. Cultural foods. Yeah. Things that are represented. You're going to get a whole new slew of research done on sociology of food and food culture. Yeah. And not just the culture of food, but food culture. Those are, those are two different things, so yeah. Food and social economic status. SES, bam. That's a great one. And I want to write that up on the board right now here because social economic status, you can use that for any topic you have. SES, social economic status. Remember, we talked about this. You can use that for any topic that you guys come up with. Um, and how do we measure social economic status? How do we talk about how we did that? What's, well, I'll give one off the bat. It's, it's the words in here. It's, e it's money. Okay? Economics. That's part of your social economic status. What's another part of your social economic status? Remember this term? What's another part of it? Anybody? Education. Okay? Education is another part of your social economic status, right? That's how we measure social economic status. What, what, el what else? Anybody know? Yes. Location, geography, right, your, your locale, where you live. You know, you ever heard that, that deal where they say this is an, a high, you know, socioeconomic status area, this is a low socioeconomic status area? That's what they talk. People tend to, to be in areas that are of like SES. That's just how it works. 
Um, it, it becomes problematic when those are represented in, of, of ethnicities and things like that. Then you got to start wondering what's going on. But so that's but that's what we good for food, socioeconomic status. What's another now, you guys? If you went in there and you said I'm interested in food, is that too broad? Yeah. What a, what what are we talking about with the sociology of food? What part of food are we talking about? I'm trying to help you guys with this so that you can just, just click through your term paper real quick and easy and, and do a good job of it. What are we talking about with like food? What part of the sociology of food? So when we're coming up with these things, so this is when you read around it. You go and you look online and you say, okay, this is what's coming up and here's an interesting twist on it. And I've oftentimes done research and I'll just put in the sociology of food and I'll come up and there'll be some random different takes on food and I get my ideas from there. But Or we can do it the way we're doing it right now and come up with our ideas like, Socioeconomic status and food, culture and food, um, all the ideas that you guys have just given me. Let's get two more before we move on. Okay, what, what, if you were searching for food and you were trying to come up with a topic of food, what would be the other, another thing that would be around food? Yes? Obesity. Okay, great. Obesity rates and, and food. Okay? I mean, that would be a wonderful one. What's another one? Uh, yeah? I was going to say food preferences. Okay, sure, preference. So they had a study in Britain where they were trying to see that it a certain a group of population had liked a certain type of tea that they did. They give it to them when they were kids and then see if they all liked it when they were adults and then compared it to the rest of the group. Of people. Good example, like branding. Like a type of tea or a brand of tea or a kind of tea, that kind of thing. Sure, absolutely. I mean, that, that's, that's some good stuff. So food preferences is huge. That's a good one. And in fact, that's similar to the research I, I've done on this is, is, is preferences on food. Yeah. Oh, that's a great one. So let's launch into that one. And forgive me if some of you, I've taught kinesiology and health in other classes. Forgive me if this is a repeat for you guys. But I want to talk right now really quickly about this topic right here. The socialization of food. Okay? You cannot, and this is, this is why this is such a good topic. There is no way of separating these two things. We are socialized to eat. You pick what you eat based upon your socialization your ethnicity, your socialization, your socioeconomic status, all these things drive why you eat what you eat. You're not separate from that stuff. And if you don't believe me, let's just look how conditioned we are to eat in terms of our, even as a nation, our national holidays. You cannot come up with one celebration, you can give me one celebration that, that does not have an associated food to it that also legitimizes it. So in other words, what I'm saying is you can't, you almost have to have certain foods to legitimize an occurrence or a celebration. Let's, let's start with our holidays as an example. Start with New Year's. What do we do on New Year's? Drink. Drink, right? You have a toast to, to New Year's. Bing, there's some drink coming right in off the bat right there. So let's go to Valentine's Day in February. What do we do on Valentine's Day? Chocolate and candy, right? I mean, that's all Valentine's Day is about is like, see, he has a door, you know, line coming out the door a mile long. I mean, Valentine's Day, you better get some chocolates for your girlfriend or boyfriend or husband or wife or you're in the shit house, right? Get your chocolates. All right? So let's go to St. Patty's Day. What do we do on St. Patty's Day? We, right? Is this being socialized? Are we socialized to do this? Yes, because let's take those, those holidays that we have already there. One, the first one is New Year's, which is done on a calendar, which is based on the Roman calendar. So, when there's some other things in there too, but I mean, so we're getting our culture and our socialization, it's open, it's just hard today. Our socialization is starting right there. The second one is Valentine's Day, which has, uh, you know, St. Valentine's Day, which has some ethnicity, culture, and nationalistic uh, uh, relativism to it. And then St. Patty's Day is massively ethnic. Everybody thinks they're Irish on St. Patty's Day, right? So, there's socialization and culture that happens here. What do we go on after St. Patty's Day? Then we have Memorial Day. What do we do on Memorial Day? Barbecue, barbecue and drink. Yeah, barbecue is right and drink. That's what we do on Memorial Day. Then, and you know, Memorial Day, I have to tell people what Memorial Day is about because they just think it's about barbecuing. And it's like, no, 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 no. There's much more to it than that, right? And then we go to July. Let's do the, the 4th of July Independence. And we, again, barbecue. And then you go to, uh, I mean, you get my point, or Labor Day, we, again, <laughs> barbecue. Seems like we love our barbecue. And then we go to October, so then we get into, uh, you know, Halloween, which is? Yeah. Candy. And then all Thanksgiving is food. Let's not lie about it. That's all that is, is food, right? 
And then we go to Christmas, and there's a Christmas ham, there's candy, there's stockings. Everything is socialized. Everything's socialized through religion. Everything's socialized through nationalistic celebrations. Every single thing. The point about this is it legitimizes our celebrations. It's almost like you can't have Thanksgiving without a turkey, right? It, it legitimizes it. Then let's go on to other things too. Dating. The socialization of dating. Oftentimes there's food involved with dating, asking somebody out to lunch or dinner or a cup of coffee. Okay, there's always food involved with this kind of thing. So to sit there and do a search for the sociology of food and go, I don't know what to do. Eh, I can't, I can't get, I don't, this is just like, it doesn't make sense, I'm just not getting it. Okay, that doesn't make any sense. Just take, I mean, my goodness, food's all around us. There's so many angles and takes that you can do on this, it's not even funny. I mean, the, 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 the angles you can do on food with sociology is incredible. Um, you know, I mean, funerals. What do you do at a funeral? You have a wake and you eat at it. Or, you know, bat mitzvahs. I mean, you can go on and on and on. So the socialization process is, is really what's at the core of all this, all right? So to not be able to find search words for food would be pretty, uh, you, you're, you're really purposely not thinking. I mean, you'd have to stop your brain from thinking not to be able to come up with some good search words for, for food on this one, okay? So, okay, so, but those are specific topics, like celebrations and, and rites of passage and rituals and stuff that have to do with food. What are some of the broader concepts that we've learned in class that you could put to food? Um, you know, we have socioeconomic status, which if you gave me, that was really good. Where are you? There you are. So yeah, socioeconomic status was really good. What's another concept we've learned in class that you might, if you just got stuck here with food that you could use, that we've learned? Any others? Socioeconomic status, what, what are some of the other things? We had culture. We had culture. We talked about what culture is. So that was good. What's another one? How about ethnicity? Ethnicity would be a good one. You could do some sort of offshoot about how, you know, culture affects food, how ethnicity affects food. Um, you know, there's plenty of, of ways you can go on that one. Um, you know, it, it's fascinating to see, uh, you know, that there's culture and it, you could have the same kind of food products in two different spots of the world, but they prepare them differently and with different spices and they turn out to be completely different food items. Um, I was, when I, I was dying in, in Scotland, I was like, I need Mexican food. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if anybody's lived abroad, that, lived abroad that, that grew up in California, but the first thing you miss is, is, is Mexican food. I mean, I was. I was like, oh my gosh. I mean, like five months into it, I was like, I will pay 100 pounds for a Taco Bell burrito, right? <laughs> like, you know, this is killing me right now. And so somebody goes, oh, there's a great Mexican joint across, you know, across town. You know, take the, so I took the, the cab there and went and got in and I sat down and I'm like, it said the same words on the menu, like, you know, enchiladas with rice and beans and blah, 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 you know, this California kind of Mexican food, you know, da, 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 da. And then I ordered it, I'm like, what the hell is this? This is not Mexican food. And the guy comes out and he's like, well, we can't get the same stuff. We don't get Monterey Jack. We don't get the, you know, but some of the stuff. So what was interesting to me, it was also their take on what Mexican food should be. So there was things like haggis burritos. I don't know if anybody's ever had haggis. Don't start. Don't start with haggis. And I mean, it just sounds bad, that word haggis, you know? And it, it, it tastes just as, 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 as like it sounds. That's just being funny. I mean, the Scottish love their haggis. But I mean, they literally, it was their ethnic take on it. So even ethnic eating is relative to the area that you're in. So it's a social construct. What your ethnicity is, what it means to people in California, means entirely different when you go to another country. Ethnicity. I mean, so it's even that is socially constructed, I had ideas of what ethnic identification should be. It's fascinating to see. And all of this plays out in food. I read an article that was talking about how food can be one of the biggest fo forces of, of solidifying peace in areas. When people start identifying with each other's ethnic foods, they have less of a tendency to be, have aggression towards each other. Isn't that fascinating? When you share the same kind of food values with somebody else, it's huge in what that does in terms of bonding, in terms of, of, of not having any types of conflicts with other ethnicities. I find that fascinating. I find that just such an interesting thing. So culture, ethnicity. Uh, globalization, how foods from different cultures might be rejected into your culture and change the water down based on 
That's right. Very good. What do we call it when culture is watered down? Diffusion. Cultural diffusion. Okay, this is how you do a good job in class. Okay, these types of terms and understanding and knowledge based stuff, this is what I want from you guys. And then connecting the dots of it. So you could take globalization and talk about it and leave it alone, but using cultural diffusion and giving an example of cultural diffusion with food would be amazing. I'd be like, wow, that is true. And it's really not that hard, is it? Just look at some of the terms, look at what you're searching, try to synthesize and analyze those things and then connect the dots on them and you've got a great paper right there or a great short answer on a quiz or something for another psych class or economics class or whatever, okay? So cultural diffusion with globalization for sure, okay? And I'm going to go over globalization, but we've already kind of been introduced to it. Yeah, give me another one. Would the typification fall under uh, socialization? Which would what? The process of using typification. Typification would, would be a socialization deal. Socialization. Yeah, but we haven't really talked about that too much in class. Yeah, but absolutely, that would be a socialization thing, which would be awesome, and it'd be very, very good for food, for, for talking about food. Okay, so, you know, uh, you, know you, you have things like national identity, okay, that would be another one that you could use here. Based upon food, we kind of touched on that a little bit, um, but, you know, there's cultural things that go around how much people, how much people value food and how much it impacts their, their identity uh, nationalistically. Um, you know, you think of what are some of the cultures uh, or na nationalistic foods we think about that are very prominent. You know, every nation kind of has their celebrated foodstuffs. And when you start talking about nationalistic identity, you can work that into the sociology of food. I mean, there's plenty of interesting things that you can do with that uh, that, that would be good for a, a topic. Um, but yeah, that's, that's certainly one. And, and let's talk about, and, and I'm going to just kind of piggyback on this because you'll probably see this on the quiz, but I do want to talk about the globalization of food because cultural diffusion abounds with this and it's just a very good topic to talk about right now. There's a lot of things that have led to globalization of food. Now, culture, ethnicity, national identity all play a part in food. And when you have this type of thing spread across the world, it really makes big changes in the way people view other nations. In other words, before prior to World War II, Prior to World War II, you could not, if you were living in Brazil, you, you, your choice of food selection prior to World War II was what was in Brazil and neighboring countries, just me immediate, you know, neighboring countries. When you were living in Germany, you could get stuff in, that's German food, but you couldn't get much out of that. If you're living in China, if you're living in Japan, you were relegated to your ethnicity and your nationalistic food choices. There wasn't a lot of trade going on prior to World War II. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of history background because it's very pertinent to what we're talking about today. After, during World War II, one of the things that changed is this. I don't know if you guys have taken U.S. history enough to know this, but in World War II, we had industrialization massively pick up. Everything was, factor, everything was in factories now. Massive production of bullets, armaments, clothes. But guess what also got massively overproduced? Food. We had to feed our GIs. We had to send food across the world. And this war was not being fought in our backyard. This war was, this war was being fought way away from us. So one of the things that we had to do was create food that wouldn't rot. And we'd have to create food that you could stack neatly onto each other so we could ship it. Okay, you had to create food that was packaged so that when you could transport it once it got off the ship. You had to create food that was appealing, that people would eat, you know, that, you know, that, that would have some, but also had, you know, those, that had some kind of caloric value to it. So high caloric value foods, high sugars, high fats. Those were the things that would give them more bang for their buck to GIs that needed to eat. Plus, we didn't have that much knowledge of nutrition. Okay, write it down and I'll get to you. We didn't have that much knowledge about nutrition. So we just kind of did whatever would give us more bang for your buck kind of a thing. So we started inventing all these kinds of foods that we processed. 
So that happened in World War II. Now right after World War II, we still had these factories. We still had this technology. We still had all these, these things that were, so guess what? What some smart people did is they said, let's turn those factories and start selling this commercially to our civilians. So that's when Nabisco happened. That's when Kellogg's happened. That's when all these companies started arising out of the factory, industri you know, the, the mass production deal. So we started getting this overly produced, and they, they had the same concepts. High caloric value, high fat, high sugar, things that would be appealing, things that you could package, things that are cheap to make, because we've got to make mass quantities of this. And so what do we end up with today? We end up with Cheetos and Doritos and, and things. These all have their roots in World War II feeding our GIs. Now, here's the kicker with the globalization. That would be fine if it was just for the United States. Really what happened was there was a country in World War II that was just decimated. And it, they were our allies. And it, it was Great Britain. It was England. Massively bombed, almost completely destroyed had no way of, of making their own food, right? So who do they turn to and what do we see as part of our job to try to help them was food. So we started shipping our food, our overly processed, that sound familiar? Overly processed, branded, packaged, crap food, low nutrient density, but would, would give you calories. We started shipping that to the British, to the English and the Scots and the Irish the people that were getting like just slammed by, by the Nazis. And so we started shipping that stuff to them. And so what happened was, well, for example, I'll tell you, this is how much that got shipped to them. 768,000 tons of food were sank between 1942 and 1946, actually, because we still had shipments that were going over there and there were mines and stuff. So 768,000 tons. That was just what was sank. So imagine the amount of food that was coming into their country that made it, right? And just a massive quantity of processed American food. All right, anybody ever seen Monty Python? It's kind of an old guy's comedy thing. But if you've seen Monty Python, which I, I find hilarious, but one of the things about it is they talk, have that spam skit. And they talk about spam this and spam that and blah, blah, blah. Well, spam was just that. Spam was this made up meat product that was byproducts from pork. And it was put in a gelatinous covering, coating, so it would fit into a can nicely, and it would travel well, and it was highly salted, so it wouldn't perish. And it was a nice metallic can that the GIs could rip open and eat. But the British loved it. I don't know what their deal was. But they were like, dude, spam's awesome. And they absolutely went spam crazy. And so they would just like, it was a, so after the war, guess what companies in the United States continued to do? Let's keep selling them spam. Let's sell them all of our products. Now, there were some products that didn't translate, like Hershey's. They, they, every British that you talk to with Hershey's chocolate would say it, it tastes like throw up. That's how they say it. You know? And it, to them, it's like just gross to them. They, they, they eat Cadbury and things like that, right? So what's fascinating is some of this stuff translates culturally and sociologically. Some of it does not translate, though, which is, which is an interesting occurrence in and of itself. So now you have our food that travels all the way across the world and it starts spreading. Now, guess what nation had obesity rates? I don't know who came up with the obesity topic, but this could be worked in here. Guess what nation's obesity rates in the 1970s started becoming like the United, closest to the United States? Great Britain. First one to have our level of obesity rates, okay? Great Britain. So it's very easy to track all this stuff. Is this sociological? Yes, it definitely is sociological because our culture got diffused and globalized in terms of food products. And like we just established, food is a massive cultural and ethnic uh, and nationalistic identity uh, item. So all of that stuff got processed. Now, and here's what's interesting about the globalization is the, the major pathways, take this down, the major pathways for globalization to spread, the globalization of culture to spread is war, which I just gave you the example of World War II, you cannot spread culture any quick, more quickly than with war. The second one would be the internet now, the interwebs, right? The internet now, you can go online and you can, like for example, I'll give you an example of this right now with the internet. Just, I give my personal examples because that's all I have to give, really. When I, I, there's these things called penguins. They're the shittiest food item ever. It's like just deep fried caramel, 
wrapped with milk chocolate in the shape of a penguin wrapped in tin foil, and you have them with your tea. And I got to like tea over there. So I would have penguins, and I got addicted to penguins. Some of them have marshmallow too. I mean, they're horrible. They're horrific, right? They, you're just more hungry after you eat them than before you started. So I'm like, oh, I got back to the United States. I'm like, oh, shit, my penguins. What am I going to do without my penguins? I, I meant to pack. I meant to go down to this at Sainsbury's is what they call the store. And I was going to buy a big crate of penguins and bring them back. So at least I'd have them for the year. So I'm all bummed out. And then like, I, I sat down. I'm like, how can I get penguins? You know, I, mean, I was really bummed out about this. And I'm like, eh, shit, I'll check on Amazon. Boom. In my house two days later. <laughs> big old box of penguins. I mean, I, mean the, I expected the drone to fly it into me, right? You know, they're going to deliver packages with Amazons, with drones and stuff. But I mean, that